Hello, everyone, and welcome back. This is Alexander Lim, and we are on another episode of Author Story. Our featured book is Vision, How It Works and What Can Go Wrong, which you can check out right now by clicking on the Amazon link in the video description below. One of the authors, Johnny e. Dowling, a neuroscientist and professor at Harvard University and has been in his field for five decades now. His co-author is Dr. Joseph L. Dowling, Jr., who is an MD and the founder of the Rhode Island Eye Institute and practice ophthalmology. So, John, welcome to Author Story. Thank you very much for being our guest. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Cool. So, John, what made you and uh, Mr. Joseph decide to write Vision, how it works? As you mentioned, I've been studying the retina of the eye as a model piece of the brain for five decades now. Mm -hmm. but. It's all been basic science, trying to understand how the retina, which of course f initiates the process of vision, how it works. Right. But the retina is much more than an array of photoreceptors. Indeed, in addition to the photoreceptors, there are four other classes of neurons in the retina. The retina, I should say, is a true piece of the brain pushed out into the eye during development. And what that means is that the retina already begins to process the visual information coming into the eye. Mm -hmm. It processes the images then that fall on the photoreceptors. Right. So I've been interested then in trying to understand how it works, how it relates to the rest of the brain and so on and so forth. So we've studied how the neurons connect together, the neurons being the cells that uh, do the business side of vision. Mm -hmm. um, how they respond to light, usually by electrical responses, uh, what chemicals they use to communicate with one another, um, the, something about the genetics of, of it, uh, and so on and so forth. So that gives you sort of a picture of my interest in vision. Now, my brother is an ophthalmologist and, of course, has spent 50 years treating patients. About 10 years ago, I was invited to chair uh, uh, um, an initiative that was sponsored by the Lasker Foundation of New York and the International Retinal Research Foundation. To, uh, it was called an initiative in vision science. The idea being, can we advance somewhat the treatment of eye diseases, uh, understand them better, and so on and so forth. And so for 10 years, then, we studied uh, a series of eye diseases, bringing together in workshops and plenary sessions, both basic scientists and clinicians. Mm -hmm. And during that experience, which is a wonderful experience, what I came to realize was that the clinicians are not really always up to date on the latest thinking about how the visual system works. Conversely, many of the basic scientists are not very clear on the major eye diseases and what needs to be done to advance our understanding of them. So it was at that point that I asked my brother if he would join with me in writing a short book that would be available not only to uh, uh, interested lay people, but clinicians who would like to know more about how the visual system works, and basic scientists who would like to know more about our present thinking about major eye diseases. So that was the origin of it. And so we worked for about two, two and a half years putting this together, and we enjoyed it very much. All right. So let, let, just to be clear then, this is a, a book, you know, even, even though uh, you're a scientist and your brother's an ophthalmologist, I mean, this is a book that any layperson can pick up and he reads it and he or she can understand what's in it. I hope so. Okay. It, when I say any lay person, certainly you would not need anything more than the, the equivalent of high school science. Okay. We wrote it uh, so that virtually any lay person could understand it. And of course, you know, vision is so important to us. That is, most people fear blindness more than any other disease, including cancer. And indeed, when blind people are asked about regaining their sight, many of them will say that they would give up several years of life to regain their sight. That's how important vision is to us. 
Yeah, and I mean that's that's the primary way means by which humans human beings take in information about the world at large. And absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know the the, uh, the the visual system, whereas we have a cortex that deals with all of our sensory input, hearing, smell, taste, touch, pain. The visual system occupies approximately fifty percent of the cerebral cortex, where the um, sensory stimuli are processed. So vision is clearly a very important the most important sense for us humans. Other animals, it's different. So for example, mouse uh, is much more smell oriented mm -hmm. than um, we are. Mm -hmm. And they, their visual system is not nearly as well developed as is ours. Okay, and I presume that that applies to other animals like say dogs as well. I mean, they're more uh, smell oriented compared to us, a lot more smell oriented than us. I'm sorry, I missed the animal you mentioned. A dog? Oh, a dog, right. Yeah. Oh, they're much more, yeah. The, the, you know, our color vision system is better than any other mammal, uh, except for a few other primates, in that we have, you know, both rods and cones. Rods mediate low light vision, the cones mediate color vision. And most mammals, like a dog and a cat and a cow and a horse, they only have two types of cones. They're what we call dichromats. They don't have nearly as rich a color vision system as we do, which is uh, we have a trichromatic system. That is that we have three uh, types of cones, which absorb maximally in the red-yellow region of the spectrum, the green region of the spectrum, and then the blue region of the spectrum. Dogs, cats, cows, horses have two types of photoreceptors. They then sense only light in the blue region of the spectrum and then the green region of the spectrum. Okay. Uh, and so that illustrates the importance of vision for us. Furthermore, we have a region in the very center of the retina called the fovea that mediates very high resolution and allows us to read, to uh, recognize faces, watch television, drive, and so on and so forth, which cats, dogs, mice, <laughs> horses uh, do not have. Right. In other words, their uh, resolution is much poorer than ours is. Right. Okay. So uh, I just I just go want to go a little a little bit to the basics here, John, because I mean a lot of people, uh, myself included, I mean we take vision for granted until you know something happens to it and we start noticing things aren't the way they are. Just for you know for for most of us people, how does uh, the mechanism of vision work? Okay, all right. Let's start from the beginning. How is light captured by the photoreceptor cells in the retina? Okay. And uh, how that is done is that there is a modified form of vitamin A. Everybody remembers their mothers saying, eat carrots. Right. It's good for your vision. Why? Because what makes carrots yellow is a substance called carotene. And if you split carotene in two, you get two molecules of vitamin A. So this vitamin A, slightly modified, combines with the protein. And that, the, the photoreceptors in the back of your eye have millions of these molecules that are there to absorb any photons of light. Any light is coming into the retina. Okay, so what happens is that when the light then falls on these what we call visual pigment molecules mm -hmm. that are in the photoreceptors. Right. It alters the shape of the, of the visual pigments in the photoreceptors. Mm -hmm. And that initiates then the excitation of, of vision. Mm -hmm. So the information then results in electrical changes in the photoreceptors themselves. The photoreceptor cell then pass on that visual message to second order cells. Mm -hmm. One of those is called the bipolar cells. It, cell that carries the information from the outer retina into the inner retina. Mm -hmm. The other cell is called the horizontal cell. And what it does is to send processes horizontally in the retina mm -hmm. 
to integrate information between photoreceptors. And that helps us see edges and borders and things of that sort. We also see changes uh, depending on the wavelength of light that's coming into the eye that occur in these second order cells. So they're starting also the process of analyzing color. The information then comes down to the inner part of the retina. And then again, there are two basic classes of cells. One, the ganglion cell that carries the output of the retina to the rest of the brain. Right. It, it's, it's long processes called axons collected the optic disc, so-called, formed the optic nerve, and then carries the information from the eye into the rest of the brain. There's also a, another cell, in some ways analogous to the horizontal cells, that is found in the inner retina called amacrine cells. And they tend to be most interested in the dynamic aspects of an image falling on the retina. In other words, they are very good at detecting movement. So we have leaving the eye then information concerning uh, the spatial distribution of light on the retina, mm -hmm. color of light on the retina, mm -hmm. and then movement of images or light on the retina. Mm -hmm. So then it moves to the uh, um, uh, way station in the mid of, middle of the brain called a lateral geniculate nucleus. And then information goes on to the cortex where um, it's further analyzed so that there are cells at the very back of the eye where visual information is first processed that respond best to oriented bars or edges. And often these bars or edges need to be moving, moving in a specific direction and so on and so forth. Then we go from the initial processing area in the back of the brain called V1, the area V2. And now we begin to find cells that are specialized for movement, cells that are specialized for form, cells that are specialized for color. And then we go from there uh, into two large visual pathways, one heading dorsally in the, the brain, <clears throat> towards the top of the brain, concerned mainly with where objects are in space how we localize things that are in space. The other direction is ventrally in the cortex, and what we find there are more and more analyses regarding form, objects, so on and so forth, so that when we get actually um, to the very base of the brain, we find cells that are specialized for recognizing faces. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so that... Um, it, that's an overview, a very, very quick, simplified overview of what's going on in the individual system. Well, I, I must say thanks for that, because I mean, like I said, just about everyone uh, takes vision for granted, but it is a complex process. I mean, uh, hats off to evolution. This is, uh, this is a complex process that works seamlessly every day. It is a very complex process, and we clearly don't understand it uh, completely. But it's probably the best neural system uh, in terms of our understanding that we have. Uh, and uh, enormous uh, progress has been made over the last 50 to 75 years. Right. Uh, you know, that said, I mean, this, this system, it's fantastic, but it can, it can also be, I know, for lack of a better word, a fool, can't it? I mean, I'm thinking about stuff like, say, optical illusions or maybe thinking that there's something there that isn't, like right. maybe okay. mistaking something for something else. You've raised a very important uh, point, and, uh, and that is, is that visual perception we talk about is being reconstructive and creative. Mm -hmm. That is, we have information about something that we're looking at coming into our eyes. Now, we interpret what that is that we're seeing, not only based on the incoming information, but also on our experience, what we're expecting to see. And that's really the basis for many, many, many visual illusions. That is, you look at something and you think you see something that's there based on your experience, based on what you are expecting to see. And so in that sense, we talk about visual perception as being reconstructive and creative.
And uh, uh, it, 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 in other words, you have to learn to see. And in point of fact, people, and, you know, people who don't have good vision as youngsters and it's not corrected uh, often will have a great de deal of difficulty ever using their eyes after the age of eight or ten, mm -hmm. even if what has caused the um, problem with the sharp images falling on the retina is relieved. They can see color, but it's vague, and they can see shapes, but they can't interpret what they're really seeing. So, you know, uh, it's very important that early on the eyes are maintained in as good a condition as possible. So, for example, there are children who were born with congenital cataracts, where the lens of the eye, which serves to help focus the image on the back of the eye, it's cloudy, so that the images falling on the back of the eye are very degraded. And uh, if that's not removed very early on, then one essentially becomes form blind uh, in, uh, in, in those eyes, and so on and so forth. You can have a problem with the cornea as well, which is important for focusing the image on the back of the eye. And if that's not maintained in a clear fashion, again, you can develop a uh, very great difficulty in interpreting any visual images falling on the retina. Right, right. And, and I think um, the, the, the vision is also, I don't call it self-correcting, because I remember, because I wear glasses, and I remember there was a time when my glasses were pretty scratched and my vision seemed okay. But when I shifted to, you know, clear glasses, I replaced those things, uh, the lens were clear. I was surprised the the images seemed somewhat sharper. So, uh, yeah, it seems that there's also some uh, I know um, some some corrective process that takes place. Well, we all go through that uh, at one time or another. Some people need glasses very early on. They're mainly what we call myopic myopic uh, vision where they're nearsighted. That is that they can see things clearly very close, but not far away. But then as we age and the lens, which plays an important role in focusing an image on the back of the eye, right. gradually stiffens. And so what happens is that to see fine print, for example, a phone book, although we don't use phone books anymore, the to see it in focus, you have to move it further and further away until you no longer can resolve the uh, phone numbers that you're looking up. And uh, so that's called presbyopia. And so in our 40s, usually, we begin to see the effects of then the stiffening of the lens. And that's when we first need glasses, usually reading glasses. And we can see things far away reasonably well, but not close up. Uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, eventually everybody needs some sort of a corrective mechanism for uh, dealing with changes that occur in the eye as a result of aging. Right, okay, okay. So other than um, nearsightedness or farsightedness, would you have any figures on what's probably the most, uh, the, uh, the next uh, most uh, impactful uh, I condition that affects the population. Yeah, well, around the world, there's no question that cataracts are the leading cause of blindness. Right. In this country, cataract surgery now is very routine, done very well, with very little in the way of side effects. It's a 20-minute operation at most, and today, uh, the incision that's needed to remove the old cataract because the way it's done now is with an ultrasound, you emulsify, that is, you break up the uh, uh, cloudy lens and you know, then suck it out. You now can even replace the lens with an artificial lens made of plastic. And uh, so at the, after a cataract operation, you will see much clearer. The color vision is better because the cataract, as it... Uh, uh, develops usually cuts out particularly blue light and so on and so forth. So around the world, it's cataracts. 
And uh, whereas here in the West, it's not a huge problem. Uh, around the world, it is the leading cause of blindness. In the West, what presently is the leading cause of blindness, and when I say blindness, I'm, I'm saying that we lose uh, uh, the ability to see fine print, recognize faces and so on and so forth. And that, of course, is related to this very tiny area in the center of our retina, colophobia, that mediates our high-resolution vision. And so today in the West, the leading cause of blindness, where we lose then the ability to make fine discriminations, is degeneration of the fovea. And that's called age-related macular degeneration. And it comes in two forms. Usually it starts in what is called the dry form, in, in which um, there are lesions that appear in and around the fovea, sometimes in the fovea itself, that begin to compromise vision. If you look at a, a, a pattern of squares, it looks no longer square, but they deviate and uh, so on and so forth. That's the beginning of dry AMD. And about 15% of the cases of dry AMD, what happens is it migrates to a more severe form of age-related macular degeneration called wet AMD, in which blood vessels grow into the fovea. They're fragile and they tend to leak, causing hemorrhage, and they can destroy uh, essentially all the foveal vision. Now, we have no way of treating at the moment dry AMD, but we do have a fairly effective way of slowing down wet AMD, not stopping it, but slowing it down. And this is by using a drug that inhibits blood vessel growth into the eye. And uh, that's been very successful. So, yeah, go ahead, please. In West, yeah, in the West, again, it's AMD, but there are a number of other uh, diseases that are fairly common glaucoma, um, in which what happens in most patients with glaucoma is that the intraocular pressure that keeps the eye round and firm increases. And that causes a loss of the third order ganglion cells in the eye and particularly their long axonal processes that carry the information from the eye to the rest of the brain. So the way we treat that or it's treated is by uh, giving drugs that lower the intraocular pressure as it's called. And then diabetic retinopathy is another problem that unfortunately is increasing in its frequency People with diabetes very often will develop a diabetic retinopathy, and that is usually seen as, again, an influx of growth of blood vessels into the retina that, again, can, are fragile and tend to leak. Those are probably the main issues that um, we're dealing with in the West. Um, AMD, as it's called, age-related macular degeneration, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy. Those are the major ways that, uh, that um, uh, vision is compromised. But again, as I mentioned earlier, as we get older, we become farsighted and everybody, virtually everybody needs glasses at one time or another. Right, right, true, <laughs> true. So given all these, uh, all these conditions, uh, what sort of research is presently being done to, to find cures to, to find corrections for these conditions? Well, we you know, would love to understand, for example, dealing with probably the most common problem that we know occurs around the world, what causes cataracts? We don't really know. Is there a way we can find to prevent cataract formation? It would be a tremendous advance for vision in people all around the world. Uh, so many of our youngsters develop um, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, so many of our youngsters, uh, you know, become myopic. That probably was your problem if you've worn glasses much of your life. Yeah. Why does the eye uh, grow abnormally large in myopic children? What is it? Why does the eye increase in its axial length? that then prevents sharp images from falling on the back of the eye unless you correct 
that growth uh, with glasses. And in other words, you're not curing the myopia, you're just correcting the uh, failure of the lens and the cornea to, to project a sharp image on the back of the eye. That is something we'd be looking at. There are a number of inherited diseases uh, that we also know about. The most common, which fortunately is relatively uncommon, is called retinitis pigmentosa. It usually appears in people in their 20s and slowly progresses so that by age 50 and 60, the people be can become completely blind. Now we know something about the genetics of that disease, retinitis pigmentosa. And indeed, in just the last couple of years, a gene therapy has been developed, just approved a year ago by the FDA and um, inserted into the eye gene therapy uh, first actually here in Boston in November. And it looks like it's working extremely well. So one's looking at the genetics uh, for inherited retinal diseases, one's trying to understand why uh, you develop dry AMD. A number of us have ideas. No, there's no, at the moment, general agreement as to what causes dry AMD. Again, we know something about wet AMD, the growth of blood vessels, and we've been successful in finding a way to treat that. Glaucoma, again, we don't know why uh, in glaucoma with extraocular pressure increases the ganglion cells in their axons tend to die. Again, we have some hints here and there, but we don't, don't have a definitive answer, which is probably what we need before we could completely cure a glaucoma. Diabetic retinopathy, <laughs> well, uh, what we know is most important there is to keep glucose levels down right. uh, and uh, lose weight. Yeah, That's very important, and so on and so forth. So, you know, we're trying to uh, learn the, the bases for th these uh, various diseases. Uh, most blindness occurs in the eye, not in the rest of the brain, although there are situations uh, in which the rest of the brain is compromised. And one of them is uh, when you, and I mentioned this before, uh, and when youngsters uh, have a crossed eye, what they tend to do is they ignore the information from the eye that's crossed. That causes changes in the cortex. That means that the individual suffering from this condition, which is called amblyopia, um, they have one good eye, but then they have an eye uh, which appears to be, you know, quite unresponsive to visual stimuli. And we're trying to understand what's going on there. Uh, so, and again, it's important to try to deal with something like that very early on. Yeah. So, for example, if you have a child with cross eyes, yeah. you hopefully the uh, they will have a, a surgical procedure that will straighten the eyes within a, the first few years of life, and that works pretty well. Right. Okay. Cool. So it, it sounds like there's a lot of exciting stuff coming along the pike. I mean. All this research well, a, yes, there is, and uh, th there are a lot of people working on virtually every one of these uh, diseases, uh, as well as people like myself trying to understand better how the retina works and the visual cortex and visual perception itself. All right, okay, cool. So, John, let's say you came across someone's concern about his vision or the vision of someone he or she is is close to someone they love maybe might be suffering from some sort of condition and you had only enough time to tell that person one thing about their condition and how it operates what would be that one thing you tell them to say with regard to yeah i mean again i would have to know what the condition is um to you know so for example if it's a problem in the lens so you don't you know can we deal with that uh, if it's a problem with the photoreceptors, and that's where many of the inherited diseases come into play, uh, we could suggest what might be done there. Or if it's, uh, say, at the level of the ganglion cells because of high intraocular pressure, that's something else. So we really need to know what the, um, you know, you know what the problem is. And this is why it's so important, and I'm not a physician, 
uh, but it, it, it's so important that we all get eye exams once a year, something like this, because very often, sometimes you can have a fair loss of vision in one eye and not realize it because the other eye is really substituting for the eye that has a problem. Okay. So I'm not answering your question very well, but I don't think I can answer it very well. All right, got that. I mean, I, I get that some questions might not be answerable. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, if there were one thing, it would be uh, great, but I'm afraid there isn't. I really right. have to know where the problem is. Right. Is it in the cortex with kids with amblyopia? Yeah where we have ways we can train the kids to use what we call the amblyopic eye. Uh, what ophthalmologists have done for a very long time is when children have developed amblyopia, the eyes now have been surgically corrected so that they are both facing forward. Is you, you know, what they do is they patch the good eye, forcing the child to use the, the amblyopic eye. And that works surprisingly well in many, many cases, and so on and so forth. All right, right. Okay, cool. So, John, uh, on this last minute or so of this interview, are, are there any last words of wisdom you'd like to share uh, with our listeners? Well, I'm, uh, we've covered a lot in the last 20 minutes or so. But, uh, again, vision is so important to us. Do everything you can to protect your eyes, I would say. Go see an ophthalmologist or uh, um, another eye specialist at least once a year. Mm -hmm. Probably once a year is sufficient if your eyes are fine. Uh, and um, don't strain your eyes. In other words, if you find that uh, the light's too dim, make it a little brighter so it's easier uh, and you, you're not straining your eyes. And keep eating carrots. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In other right. words, good, good nutrition is important for vision as it is for everything else yeah true true cool okay so then the in closing then the book is vision how it works and what can go wrong uh the guest was the authors john e dowling and the co his co-authors dr joseph l dowling jr and you can find their book on amazon so john thank you very much for being an author story thank you very much for sharing your expertise i'm sure a lot of folks will pick up uh, quite a bit from here very good. Thank you. I've enjoyed this uh, conversation very much, and I hope it's useful to many of your listeners. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. And there we have it, folks. Please check out Vision, How It Works and What Can Go Wrong, and take a gander as well as some of our author authors and books, which we have already covered in Author Story. And subscribe to our channel if you want. So I'll see you guys all next time on Author Story, where we speak to another great author about another great book.